Ephesians chapter 3 is where we're at this morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, we're kind of wrapping up a little section here, and, uh, which is basically going from verse 1 down to verse 13. And uh, in, in this section, Paul has been arguing and talking through this idea that, that he has the overwhelming privilege by the grace of God to speak this unsearchable riches of Christ, that there's this mystery there's this plan, there's this wisdom of God, that there's this eternal purpose which God has been establishing and doing from the very beginning of time. And as he talks about it here, it's the fact that the Gentiles get to come in and participate and partake of the very things that the Jews had access to. Uh, when you step a little bit further back, he, he's talking about this idea that the mystery, the riches the, uh, the purpose that God's had from the very beginning of time has been Jesus. And that Jesus is to be the very center of all things. That, in fact, he's bringing all things in creation. He's bringing all things in humanity. He's bringing all things in the church to be focused and centered upon Jesus. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Do you realize that, that God has had an eternal purpose and plan which focuses on Jesus? And that when he created Adam and Eve, the purpose of why he created humanity was that they were going to be image bearers of the reality of Jesus, the life of Jesus. That they were to experience the life of God, that they were to have relationship with God, which is what you see them, walk, you see them walking in the garden in the cool of the evening with God himself that they're experiencing the life, the very presence, the Spirit of God in their lives. And what you see is that when they fell and they rebelled and they, took, they chose sin, do you realize that God has been in a redemptive plan? It's not a plan B. But there's a redemptive plan to bring you back to his plan, which is all about Jesus. Jesus has always and forever been the plan. Jesus has always been the focus. He's always been the purpose. He's always been the delight. Hey, this is always focused upon him. In fact, every page of this book is focused on that reality, Jesus. And so Paul has been talking about this incredible declaration of it's all been in the life of Jesus. And so would you just get wrapped up in Jesus? Would you just make his life the purpose of your life? Hey, would you, would you enter into his presence with bold confidence because you have access in, into the very presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? That this is not just, well, you know, hey, I'm a Christian. I go, to, I go to church on Sundays. Praise the Lord. Do you realize that if, that, if, that's, if that's your level of Christianity, you are missing the great depths of life and richness in Jesus? Because everything that God has for you is found in Jesus. Every blessing he has for you is in Jesus. Or as 2 Peter 1.3 would say, everything that you need for life and godliness is found in Jesus. So he's been walking through that in, in chapter 3 of Ephesians from verse 1 all the way down through verse 12. And what I want to do today is, is look in this session, uh, look at verse 13 with you. Uh, he, in verse 14, which we're going to get into another series starting soon, uh, in verse 14 down to the end of the chapter, he's going to be giving his second prayer. Uh, he did the first one at the end of chapter 1. He's giving another prayer here in this section, and it is absolutely phenomenal. But right at the end of this section, talking about the mystery and the plan and the purpose, all focus on Jesus, and right before he gets into the prayer, he gives verse 13. And he says this, Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. He starts and says, therefore, and of course, you know, every time you see the word therefore, you need to ask yourself, what is the therefore, therefore? <laughs> well, the therefore obviously is pulling back into verses 1 through 12. And he's saying, again, he's, he's going back to this idea of the plan and the purpose and the mystery and the riches all focus on Jesus Christ. And he says, therefore, be, because of that incredible, phenomenal reality that you now get to participate in and demonstrate to the world around you, he says, I ask you, don't lose heart. Hey, don't, don't despair. Don't grieve. 
hey, don't, hey, don't let this be heavy upon you at my tribulations on your behalf. Paul says, I have these tribulations and they are on your behalf. That, that, that I've, been, I've been walking through and I've been doing all these things on your behalf and I've been facing trials and sufferings and, and persecution and beatings and, and shipwrecks. And of course, you know, you go down through his list and he's been beat with a cat of nine tails five times. He's been, you know, uh, stoned. He, you know, he's been uh, hit him with rod multiple times. He just, he just has this, he has faced a lot of tribulations. But he says, hey, don't lose heart of that. Don't let that dis- cause despair. Hey, don't let that cause a heaviness in your soul. Rather, you need to realize that my tribulations on your behalf are actually your glory. <laughs> I look at that, I go, Paul, I, I, don't, I, I don't think you know what you're talking about. Paul, I, I think you're a little confused. Paul, I, I, think, I think you've mistaken something here because, Paul, the reality is, is if I'm facing tribulations or if you're facing tribulations, there is no glory in that whatsoever. Paul says, oh, you've missed this. There is tremendous glory in tribulation, uh, which is what I want to talk about. Uh, a couple of months ago, I was doing a study for, for Ellerslie and, and uh, was working through this idea of hardship and difficulty and pressure and pain and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and I came, came to this idea of tribulation. And it was interesting, as I was looking at this idea of tribulation, I, I see tribulation through the lens of problems. I, I see tribulation through the lens of uh, not good. I, I see tribulation in the sense of uh, how, how far can I stay away from it? Or how quickly can I get through the tribulation so I can finally get to the rest and the peace and the comfort and the oh, kind of stuff. But biblically, tribulation is typically a good thing. Uh, tribulation, there's two words that are often translated tribulation. One is thalibo and the other one sleeps us. Uh, thalibo is used 10 times in the New Testament 76 times in the Old Testament, if, if you're looking at the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And Philipsis, uh, that word shows up 45 times in the New Testament and 104 times in the Old Testament. In other words, this is, this is all over the place. And what's interesting is both of those words, and they're, they're very similar, both those words have this idea of tribulation, pressure, weight, compression, difficulty, anguish, trouble, distress, suffering, persecution, affliction, proving. Oh, don't you want more of that list? You know? And both of the words are used in connection with harvesting. It's a, it's a threshing language. It's the threshing of wheat stuff. Uh, it's very similar to this idea of pruning branches, right? You have this you have this uh, vine, and you want, you want it to grow more fruit. So what do you do? You prune back uh, the, the, the vine. Or if you have a rose bush, uh, I had this little rose bush in the house uh, when I moved in, and, and uh, I just, I didn't, I didn't, I've, never, I've never had roses, so I just kind of let it go. And uh, the first year, it only had a couple of roses. I'm like, well, this thing's dumb. <laughs> I'm like, I'll, just, I'll just rip it out. You know, like, I don't want the thorns. Uh, if, I, if I'm going to have is a plant of thorns, that's not good. And I was talking to my mom one day, and she says, uh, have you thought about trimming it? I'm like, why would you trim it? If I trim it, nothing's going to grow. She goes, just trim the thing down. And it was amazing. I cut that puppy down, and the next year, pff, lots of roses. See, there's, there's fruit. There, there is the life that comes out of the pruning. And pruning's actually a good thing. I uh, read John 15. Pruning's a really good thing. Because if you're not being pruned, you're a dead branch. And if you're a dead branch, they're just going to burn you. But Jesus says, if there's life in you, guess what the, guess what the vine dresser is going to do? He's going to prune you. Uh, that idea of threshing, right? This idea of pruning. Uh, it's also the idea of squeezing grapes. Like if you're going to make uh, juice or wine, right? You, you, you take the grape and you put it in a big vat. And of course, Jewish culture was, is, is you would get on there and you do a little dance and you do your little thing and, and it would squeeze. And, and the life of the grape would literally be squeezed out of the grape. Uh, the whole threshing, the threshing thing is really what I got into. Uh, so, such an incredible picture. Uh, you, probably, you, you probably already know this, but, uh, you know, you go, out to, you go out to harvest, and of course in that day, in that culture, you take the sickle and you, you go through and you cut down the wheat 
and you grab all these wheat bundles and you bring it into the threshing floor. And of course, you'd spread out the wheat and you'd usually bring like an ox in and you'd, you'd tie this threshing sled to the back of the ox and, and then you would usually sit or stand on the threshing sled to put some weight on it and you let the ox walk around in a circle and so you'd have the, the hooves of the ox tromping on the, on the wheat. You'd have the threshing sled, which is like this piece of wood that you would carve these little notches out of and you put stone, sharp stone uh, or glass or whatever else you can find that's sharp and you put that down on it and so it's really cutting and making, you know, making these grooves on, on the wheat and you just go around and around and around. And then after that, you take your threshing fork, your, you know, your, like your uh, uh, pitchfork kind of an idea. And, you, and you, you put it down and you throw it up into the air. And you let the breeze catch the chaff. And so the, the chaff will be taken and blown away. And then the wheat, it's heavier. The grains would fall, fall back to the ground. And so that's how they make grain to make the bread. And aren't we thankful we can just go down to the store and just buy a, a thing of flour? You know, <laughs> praise the Lord. But look at this. That idea of, hey, I, I, I grab the wheat, I put it on, on the threshing floor, and then I take a threshing instrument, right, this sled, and I, and I let the, the ox trample upon the wheat, put the ox sled slicing and dicing the wheat, and then I take the fork and I throw it up. Do you know what you are in this picture? You're the wheat. And there's this tribulation, that's where the word comes from, that happens on the wheat. That there's all this threshing happening. What do we call that threshing? It's tribulation. That as the ox stomps upon your head, as the threshing sled comes by and it just starts, starts chopping and dicing and all that kind of stuff, do you realize we look at the tribulation, we look at the threshing, and we say, oh, no, this is miserable. Ah, I don't want this kind of stuff. And yet... Do you recognize that if it wasn't for the threshing, if it wasn't for that tribulation, that the value of the wheat would not be expressed? It would not be seen. There is no value in wheat in just a bundle of, of the stalks. See, the value of the wheat comes after the threshing. See, the value of the vine comes after the pruning when the fruit is produced. The value of the wine is not in the grape. The value of the wine or the juice is after the grape is squeezed. And so threshing or tribulation is a bettering of something to increase its value. It, it, it is to remove what is unnecessary or that which hinders in order to prepare it for its intended or ultimate purpose. Do you realize that the same thing is true in our lives? That God delights to use tribulation and difficulty and trials to get you to the point where you're actually able to be used? That, that the value of your life is, is not in the, the, the vessel of you full of selfishness and sin? That, that, we, we, that God allows trials and tribulations and difficulties and problems and pain in our life, not, not because he rejoices in the difficulty, it's because he sees what that difficulty is going to accomplish in our lives, which is Christ-likeness, which is godliness. It, it, the tribulations conform us to his image. I, I love how those mountain peak experiences spiritually. You, you know, you, you go to a conference or you go to uh, you know, a school of some sort, or you have an event, or a great worship time, you're just like, wow, there's just, whoa, this, this, this mountaintop experience. And, and spiritually, I, I think we need those on occasion, because it's from the top of the mountains that you can, you can see where you're heading, and you can see, you can see the higher, higher peaks, and you can say, hey, this is where I'm going over here. And, but you realize that nothing grows at the top of mountain peaks. Now, I'm, not, I'm not talking like the Appalachian Mountains or the Appalachians if you live out there. But, you know, like, like true mountains, which in my, my definition of a true mountain is that the top of the mountain goes above the tree line, right? Like some of the Rocky Mountains, 14,000 feet, right? It comes a point where there's nothing grows. It, it's too high. See, that's a mountain. And we need those kind of experiences because, wow, you can see and it's, it's beautiful. And, man, there's just a stirring. And, but do you realize that that's not where things grow? The best place to grow things are in the valleys. It's in the hardships. It's, it's in the pressures of, of life. Look, just think about your, your life and your past. 
Isn't some of the greatest times of growth, sanctification, godliness, that God was doing something in you? It wasn't when things were easy. It was when things were difficult. See, it's in that threshing. It's in the tribulation that God somehow, not that he causes it, it's that he allows it in our lives to use it for our good. It's that Romans 8, 28 principle, right? That he's, he's using all things for his good according to his purpose and his plan for those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. See, he's using all of this in, in, our, in our lives. Why? Because he has a purpose and a plan, which is what? To look like Jesus. That, that we, are, we are to become more Christ-like, that we are to live in holiness and godliness, that we are to be conformed to his image. And as such, he's going to use all these things in our life to Remove the chaff, that selfishness and that sin and, and that self-focused reality that we all have. See, there's no value in you full of sin. There's no value if you're so self-focused. God says, I can't use you like that. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to allow you to go through some difficulty and trials and tribulation. Why? So I can start removing some of that stuff. I, 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 hey, this is good for you. Paul says, this is for your glory. See, tribulation and, and testing and trials and all that kind of stuff, the pain, the problems, in one sense, it becomes the weight room for the soul. Uh, several months ago, uh, back, in, back in February, I decided that I was uh, sick and tired of being sick, sick and tired, <laughs> tired. I was just, you know, I was, I was, I was overweight and and I, I wasn't healthy, and I was tired all the time. And I just said, okay, I, I'm done talking about getting healthy. I, need, I just need to actually do it. And I'd read all the books, and I just, nothing was ever happening. So I decided to put my money where my mouth was, and I hired a trainer. And all right, let's, let's work on the food stuff. Let's work on the workout stuff. And, and so I'm going down to the gym every day, and uh, uh, the trainer says stuff like, all right, uh, I'm going to put you on a bench. And so, you know, he puts me on a bench and he says, all right, I want you to grab that bar and I want you to lift the bar. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Have you seen how heavy those bars are? You know, and I, I'm trying, I'm, I'm moving it. And, uh, and after a while, you know, the bar becomes rather easy. And so, so the trainer says, all right, today um, you're going to do the bar, plus we're going to add five pounds on each side. And I was like, no, I was, just, I was just getting used to the bar. I'm fine. I'm fine with just the bar. He says, no, you're not. Because if you just keep doing the bar and you don't increase the pressure and the difficulty, then your muscles are not actually going to grow. You need to keep taxing your muscles if you want them to grow. And I'm like, fine. So we add the five pounds on. And then, you know, after a few weeks, you know, he says, hey, we're going to add some more, more weight on this thing. And I said, I'm just, I'm finally getting used. To, I'm, I'm able to finally do this one. He says, I know that. That's why we need to add more weight. And then we add more weight. And we add more weight. And we add more weight. Do you realize that God does that too in our souls? That, that, that here you are, and, and he wants to move you and sanctify you and conform you to his image. And one of his primary means of doing that is allowing the temptations and the trials and the, the testings and the, the difficulties in your life. Why? Because as you stand up against the temptations and you walk in victory, hey, as you face and walk triumphantly with joy through trials and problems and difficulties, do you realize it actually strengthens your spiritual life? And Paul says, that's actually a good thing for you. So listen, listen to this. This is Hebrews chapter 12, talking about discipline. None of us like discipline. Discipline is miserable unless you know the purpose of discipline. So listen to this. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 12 verse 5, starting in verse 5, uh, You have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son... Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? And then later down in verse 10, he says, For they disciplined us, speaking of our fathers who discipline us, they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who've been trained by it, afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Do you realize that discipline 
is actually good for our lives. That, that when we are shaped and we are being pressed and more weight is being put upon our soul, do you realize it is actually a great thing? Why? Because it allows us to lean and trust and depend upon him more. It proves out his faithfulness. We are showcasing the reality of his life, that, that we, are, we are the ones who live by faith with bold, confident access in him, that we are living in his life, and as such, his life is being demonstrated through us, that this is not by our ability or our accomplishments or our strength or our talent or our wisdom. This is by his power, by his strength. That, that we get to begin to result this, or we get to uh, exhibit this peaceful fruit of righteousness in our lives. Why? Because of the discipline. See, we need discipline. Romans chapter 5, this, this, this verse to me has just blown me out of the water. Uh, listen to what Paul says, Romans 5, verse 3 through 5. Paul says, not only this, but we exalt, we boast, we brag, is the word, in our tribulations. Pause right there. Excuse me, Paul, uh, you're telling me you are bragging about your tribulations, that you're going to boast about the trials of your life? Paul goes, yep. Yeah, I'm going to talk about them all the time. I'm going to talk about how great the fact that I got to be beat up and I got to be stoned and I got to be shipwrecked and I, I faced all these trials and difficulties and hardships and problems and pain. And why? Why, Paul? He says, because I know, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, perseverance brings about proven character, proven character brings about hope, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Paul says, the reason I boast and brag and exult in my tribulations is because I know what tribulation is bringing about. See, tribulation, the trials, the difficulties, the sufferings bring about perseverance. It's, it's the Greek word hupomone. And that word literally is this idea of patience or long suffering. And uh, it's really the idea of uh, tinsel strength. Not, not the stuff on Christmas trees. That's, that's something else. But tinsel strength is the measurement of like a chain or a rope. And the idea is the greater the resistance, uh, the greater the resilience, uh, the greater the pressure that a rope can have without breaking, the greater the tinsel strength, the greater the tinsel number. So Paul says, do, do you realize what God is doing in you is that he's adding more weight to your bench press so that your spiritual muscles will, will grow in the weight room. And he's going to add a little bit more, and he's going to add a little bit more, and he's going to add a little bit more. Why? Because it's growing your tinsel. It's growing your resilience. It's growing your patience. It's growing your long suffering. It allows you to deal with greater and greater difficulties over longer and longer periods of time. And you need that as a Christian. So, hey, this is God's weight room for the spiritual life. Uh, it's interesting. I look back on my life five years ago or ten years ago, and I laugh at the difficulties I was facing. And I, I know at the time they were really heavy and they were really crazy, but, but I look back in, in the viewpoint of what I'm dealing with now, and I go, if I could handle those problems back then, that would be like a vacation. Like, if I could go back 10 years to the, the issues that I was dealing with 10 years ago, it seems like that would be a vacation compared to the pressures on my life now. Why? Because they're growing. And yet God is also increasing my resilience and my strength and my, my tinsel rating, my, my long-suffering, my patience. And I, I'm able to go through trials and difficulties now unlike I've ever been able to. But I also know that in 5 or 10 years from now, I'll be able to look back at this season and go, buddy, buck up. That, 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 hey, that God, God has been growing me and that he's going to keep growing me to the point where this is going to look like a vacation five, ten years from now. Huh, I looked at the whole COVID thing as we were dealing with COVID. I'm, I, yeah, it was crazy for a little bit, but I started to laugh because I'm like, you know what? This is actually not that difficult. That, that if God has been training you in the trials and the perseverance and the, the pressures of life, th it actually was fun to me. I, and not that I want to go back and repeat it. <laughs> and culture was crazy. Culture was going bonkers. But, but that's my point. No one was trained in the discipline of the Lord. No one, ha, no one ha, knows how to deal with the difficulty and the suffering and the trials. Everyone wants just the, it's that me-centered, comfort, pampered, whatever. And so when things get difficult, we all fall apart. 
We all head to the alcohol and the entertainment and the drugs and the whatever. And yet, do you realize that when the COVID seasons of life come, if God has been training you in difficulty, that actually makes you thrive. It's almost like a bodybuilder who's been training in the gym every single day, every single day, and finally it's competition day, and he goes over and they say, all right, here, here's, your, here's your competition. Uh, pick up this five-pound dumbbell. And you're like, that's all I have to do? Okay. <laughs> it, it's, it doesn't seem that difficult when you've been training in the gym all the time and you're, and you're picking up 50 pounds, 75-pound dumbbells all the time. See, what if you would recognize that it's not that God causes the chaos. He doesn't. He's not an author of chaos. He's not an author of sin. He does, not, he, does not tr- he does not produce sin. But he will allow certain things in your life, and he will allow the enemy to do things in your life. And what the enemy means for evil and what the enemy means for destruction, he wants to use and flip it for his purpose and his plan. And he wants to use the same temptation that the enemy wants to used to bring you down, God says, hey, can we use that as a training practice for you to walk in victory and triumph? Uh, if, you, if you need a mental image, think of like batting practice, right? All right here's the enemy, and he's throwing you a pitch <sighs> called a temptation. And typically what has happened is it's always, <sighs> it always hits us, or a strike is called. But what if you would learn that every, every pitch that is thrown by the enemy in temptation can actually be batting practice, <sighs> For you to hit it out of the park. Now, the enemy is betting or he's playing the game in such a way where he thinks at some point you're going to grow weary and tired and no longer use the bat. But if you keep swinging and if you keep hitting those balls, you become a better and better baseball player. Okay, cheesy illustration. I get that. But what if you would realize that every trial, every temptation, every circumstance, every difficulty, every problem, every pers- persecution, every, everything like that, God, even if the enemy is meaning it for destruction and evil in your life, God can use that very same thing to bring about life, to bring about triumph, to bring about a greater sense of godliness, a greater movement of Christ's likeness, a greater conformity to the image of Christ. See, when temptation comes in my life and I, by faith, lean on Jesus to deal with my temptation and I walk in victory and freedom and triumph and peace, do you realize it actually strengthens my faith? It strengthens my resolve. It strengthens my confidence in Jesus. It, it, it strengthens my spiritual life. And now the next time it, a temptation shows up, I can be like, I got, I got, this makes sense. Lord, I'm not going to turn to myself. I'm going to turn to you. And we never turn to ourselves. We always turn to him. But as, as God continually proves himself out in the trials and the temptations of life, we get stronger. So what if you would rejoice in the pruning of John 15? Uh, what if you would embrace the hardships of your life? I love what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. Uh, 2 Timothy is the last book that Paul wrote. Uh, he's, a, he's about to uh, uh, suffer martyrdom in, in Rome. He's about to be executed. And he writes, he writes a letter to Timothy, which is 2 Timothy. And uh, this very last writing of Paul, listen, listen to what Paul says. He says to Timothy, you, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. He says, suffer hardship with me. It's the Greek word, son kakapatheio, which is (laughs) is a mouthful. But that word, suffer hardship, has this idea of to endure difficulty, endure hardship. And the idea actually is to, to reach your arms around and to bear hug the difficulties and the struggles of life. So if you are facing hardship, if you are facing difficulties, Paul says, do you know what you should do? Embrace it. Bear hug it. Just just grab a hold of it. Isn't that amazing? So really quickly, just want to close with this idea of how can we actually walk through tribulation well? So, So here are five ways that we can triumph amidst the tribulation. 
So as the ox is stomping on your head, as that threshing sled is, is walking and cutting you to pieces, as you're being threshed and going through tribulation, how do you triumph in the middle of that? Five quick ideas. Number one, keep your look upon the Lord. Keep your focus. Uh, in Matthew chapter 14, verse 28 through 30, uh, there's this big storm and the disciples are in the boat and they look and they, they, see, they see Jesus walking on the water. And Peter looks at Jesus and says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. And so Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Wouldn't it be interesting had Peter not turned his gaze from Jesus, but kept his gaze on Jesus? I would have loved to hear what the story would have said. But here, here's, G, here's Peter. As he gets out of the boat, he's looking at Jesus, and then suddenly he turns to the winds and the waves and all this stuff, and he starts to sink. Wouldn't it be interesting in the winds and the waves of life if we didn't get caught up in the distraction of that winds and the waves, that tribulation, but we kept our focus where it should be on Jesus? And if you want to triumph in the midst of your tribulation, number one, you've got to keep your eyes upon the Lord. Keep your focus. Keep your look upon him. Number two, it's really important to realize or know the purpose of the pruning. When you turn to John 15, you realize that, that a branch that is alive will be pruned. Why? To bring about more fruit. Uh, James 1, 2 through 4 says, Count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. See, see, you are to consider it joy when you're facing trials and tribulations and difficulties. Why? Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and that endurance when it has its perfect result, you'll be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So you've got to know the purpose of the pruning. Again, Revelation 5, I read this earlier, but Revelation 5, 3, not only this, but we boast, brag, exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, hupomone, perseverance, proven character, proven character, hope, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So how are you going to triumph in tribulation? Keep your look upon the Lord, number one. Number two, know the purpose of the pruning. Number three, celebrate in all circumstances. First uh, Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That you are to rejoice always. And the word always in Greek means always. Uh, in everything give thanks. You know what the word everything in Greek means? It means everything. So you are always to be rejoicing in everything giving thanks. What if you would celebrate every circumstance of your life, whether good, bad, or ugly? Well, what, what if you'd be facing a trial or, or a, a testing or a tribulation or a, a temptation and be like, Lord, thank you for this opportunity to trust you. Lord, Lord, thank you that you have given me all things that I need for life and godliness. Lord, thank you that in the middle of this temptation, that I am more than a conqueror in you, Christ Jesus, my Lord. And as such, I do not have to give in to sin. I can walk triumphantly in you. What, what if you would rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks? For this is God's will for you. Uh, 2 Corinthians 7, 4 at the end of that verse, Paul says, I am filled with comfort. I am overflowing with joy in all our affliction. That I am just, oh, I'm so full of comfort and joy. Smack dab in the middle of all my problems. Why? Oh, because I know who has me in the middle of them. Number four, there's this idea of for this I have Jesus. And I have it in kind of like quotes, but I heard this story some, some time a year or two ago about this man who, where in every circumstance, he always said, for this, I have Jesus. When things went well, for this, I have Jesus. When things went poorly, 
for this, I have Jesus. And if I remember the story correctly, he came home one day and his house had burnt down to the ground and he had lost everything. And so one of his friends looked at him and says, what are you going to do? And he just smiled and said, you know, for this, I have Jesus. See, what if we would have that same perspective? What, what if we'd have that same attitude of, I am weak, but he is strong. I don't have it, but he's all that I need. And so no matter the tribulation, no matter the trial, no matter the pressure, no matter the difficulty, oh, for this I have Jesus. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, that God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, says Paul, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Why? For this I have Jesus. For this I have Jesus. So how, how do you triumph in the midst of tribulation? Number one, keep your look upon the Lord. Number two, know the purpose of the pruning. Number three, celebrate in all circumstances. Number four, what if you would realize that for this you have Jesus? And number five, would you place the pack, the burden, upon the Lord? Psalm 37, 5 says, Commit your way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he will do it. That word commit has this idea of to roll a burden upon a beast, a burden. Uh, if I looked at you and I said, okay, you need to carry a thousand pounds across 500 miles of desert, could you do it? No. That, that's too great of a difficulty. That, that's impossible. Unless you took that thousand pound burden and you rolled that burden upon a beast, a burden, like a camel or a donkey, and you roll that big pack, that weight upon a, on a camel, do you realize that you could take the reins of the camel and only really walk the 500 miles across a de desert carrying the 1,000-pound burden? But you weren't the one carrying the weight. So listen to what God says in Psalm 37, 5. It says, commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he will do it. Do you realize that the Lord is looking at you saying, can I, can I be your beast of burden? And I know that sounds like a downgrade, but, but would you take all of your concerns and would you take all of your problems and, and take all of your cares and would you just roll those up upon my back and would you just allow me to carry this burden in your life? Commit your way unto the Lord. Trust in him and he will do it. Peter says something very similar in 1 Peter 5, 7. He says, cast all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. And would you take every concern, all your anxiety, all the trials, all the tribulation, all the persecution, all the pressure, hey, everything that you're facing in life, whether it's family, whether it's finances, whether hey, it doesn't matter what it is, would, would you just take all of that and roll it upon the back of your Lord? He cares for you. He can carry it. So again, those, those five things, how are you going to triumph in tribulation? Keep your focus on Jesus. Hey, know the purpose of why you're going through the, the trial and the difficulty. He's working something good through the middle of it. He is accomplishing his purpose and his plan through you. He's making you more godly, more holy, more sanctified. He's conforming you to his image through the midst of the trials and the, the tribulations. Number three, what if you would rejoice in all circumstances? What if in the midst of keeping your gaze upon him, you'd realize that, that for this you have Jesus, number four, and that, that you could just celebrate and rejoice all the time because he has not abandoned you. He has promised, as Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 says, that he has promised you, I will never, ever, ever leave or forsake you. And if he has promised it, it is guaranteed and number five, what if you would just take all that burden, all that trial, all that tribulation and let him carry it in your life? That, that yeah, you're walking through it and yeah, you got to experience it and, and yeah, you still got to walk the 500 miles through the desert, but the whole weight, the burden of this thing is upon him, not upon us. 
Would you remember, as Paul says in our passage, look at this again. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 13. He says, do not lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf. They are your glory. Do you realize that tribulations are a good thing, says Paul. Hey, you should just boast, as he says in Romans 5, 3. You should just brag. You should just exult in your tribulations and trials. Why? They're, they're your glory. They are what God is using as a primary means to mold and shape you in Christ's likeness. That, that he's using all this stuff to mold and shape you, to conform you to his image, to make you more and more holy. That's a phenomenal thought. Would you look at all the trials and all the circumstances of your life and say, Jesus, instead of trying to figure out how fast I can get through my problems, instead of trying to worry about how, how quick can I get back to comfort and ease, Lord, would you use whatever's in front of me, whatever I'm going through at this moment, would you use it to sanctify my life? Would you use it to press me unto you? Would you use it to give me a greater focus of you? Could you somehow take your life and would you somehow demonstrate your life through me as the onlooking world sees how I'm handling my tribulations and trials? Lord, would you, will you just do a phenomenal work in my life? Would you, would you do this thing in me that I can't just produce on my own? And Would you know the purpose of why he's allowing you to go through the trials and the difficulties of life? It's for our good. So instead of being miserable in the weight room, instead of grumbling as you walk through the doors of the gym, would you say, Lord, I'm giving, you, giving this time to you as worship? Lord, Lord, will you take this gym tribulation season I have right now and will you just use it for your purpose and for your plan, for your goodness and for your glory? And would you take your life and so form it in me that, that like the tribulation, the threshing floor, that you would just remove more and more of the chaff from my life, that the value of my life comes through the tribulation because now I'm a vessel fit for the king. That now you can use me because I, I'm, not, I'm not all wrapped up in the pride and the selfishness. And, the, and yes, that's a lifelong process. I get that. But would you, would you let him walk you through and let, let the ox hooves stomp on your head and the, the threshing sled to just slice you all up to pieces because you know that oh, there's not to be chaff in our lives. And that he's using us for our good according to his purpose and his plan to conform us to his image. Oh. Pray with me. Jesus, wow. Lord, I, I'm just, I'm dumbfounded by the, the thought that, that trials and tribulations and difficulties and problems can actually be a good thing in our lives. The, the very things that, that I often run away from, the very things that I, I just dread, the very things I just wonder how quick can I get through it, the very things that I, I, I try to do something else so I could live more in comfort and ease are actually the very thing you want to use to bring about your life within me. Lord, could I, could I not shy away from the difficulties? Could, could I not shy away from hardship? Could, could I not pull back from the trials of life but in the midst of them, could, could I keep my focus on you and smile and rejoice knowing that you have a purpose and a plan to use all those trials, to use all those difficulties, to use all those circumstances and problems and tribulations to work out your eternal purpose and plan and mystery in my life. Which is that I would get to experience you and that, I would, that my life would demonstrate you to the world around me. And Lord, I'm convinced if, if, if the problems of my life increased, it would force my desperation and my cling to you to increase. And so like Paul, as Paul exhorted Timothy, Lord, every time hardship and trials come in, could, could I reach around and, and would you give me the grace to bear hug and endure this hardship well? Lord, what would it look like in the middle of those difficulties that I, rather than turning within, I would lean toward you and I would become more dependent, more surrendered. I would, I would be more abiding in your life that I would trust and live by faith in you. Why? Because I have bold, confident, confident access to you. 
that I can actually have access to your life and your grace to handle the tribulations and the difficulties. And as such, you are producing your life in and through those to bring about your eternal purpose and plan in and through me. Oh, what an incredible reality, Jesus. Wow, what an incredible reality. Lord, let us not shy away from the difficulties of life. Rather, let us boast and glory in them because we know what you're doing through them. Lord, thank you that you can use all things for your good, that you can use all things for your purpose and plan. And so, Lord, we just give you all the praise and the glory and the adoration that you rightly deserve. Love you, Jesus. We pray all of this in your holy and precious and incredibly precious, powerful name. Amen.